Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, coming to you live, pre-recorded, from the guest bedroom at Casa de Franco. So far, it appears that COVID has not kicked my ass, but has unfortunately resulted in the symptoms of my nose just won't stop running, and I'm irritated by anyone that tries to interact with me. But taking it a day at a time, and we'll see. Like I said, as long as I have a voice, there will be a show, so buckle up. Hit that like button if you want me to punch you in the throat and let's just jump into it. Yo, first up today, Red Bull may be in trouble. And that's because of this absolutely stunning, record-breaking stunt they tried to do in Arizona, which, you know, as anyone that's ever gone to ASU can tell you, Arizona is the perfect place to make some mistakes. With a company attempting, and the key word is attempting, to make cousins Andy Farrington and Luke Akins the world's first pilots to take off in one plane and land in another. Or more accurately, land in each other's planes because the plan was to go up in two separate single engine planes. Then at 14,000 feet, drop in a tandem nosedive, jumping out of their own planes and crawling into the others, pulling them back up out of a nosedive just 2,000 feet above the ground, which, you know, super simple, a regular Sunday. So everything goes fine for one of the pilots with him managing to regain control the plane and land safely. The other guy just has to watch as the plane he's supposed to get in spins out of control and ultimately crashes into the desert. So he pulls his parachute and he lands on his feet instead. And here's the bit of good news. Even though this was incredibly risky, nobody got hurt, which I mean, we kind of just have to be thankful that the pilot didn't get into the plane before it spun out of control. But it, it turns out this stunt may not have just been risky, but in fact illegal. Right? Because the FAA requires pilots to man their planes at all times for obvious reasons. But reportedly Andy and Luke, the pilots here, asked for a waiver beforehand, arguing that the event would be in the public interest since it promotes STEM fields. Except you have the FAA saying, cool story, bro. We denied your request on Friday. We said, no, this just isn't safe. Even despite the pilot saying they held commercial pilot's license, they conducted over 20,000 skydives and more than 100 dive test flights without incident. So now you have the FAA investigating the crash. You have the National Transportation Safety Board opening an investigation. And so we'll have to see what happens from there. But I will say for Luke, this was kind of a tame stunt. I don't know if you remember him, but back in 2016, this is so crazy. Back in 2016, he dove from 25,000 feet without a parachute to our wingsuit, and he successfully landed in a net half the size of a football field. So it'll be interesting to see what happens from the investigation, but I'm sure this is not the last we're gonna hear from these guys. And then, in both amazing and at the same time kind of depressing, because we as a society constantly compare ourselves to other people in better situations, we need to talk about Bad Baby, because she posted a picture that appears to show that net money, not even gross money, net money she brought in $42 million from OnlyFans over a year. Right, and she did this because she previously claimed she made $50 million on the platform, which you can see in her gross total, but apparently enough people doubted her, so she just came in hot with these receipts. And the thing is, like, I do well for myself, but this made me feel middle class. Now, I'm not gonna be a hater. I believe that sex work is real work. I've been very, very clear about that. Granted, with this specific situation, it does feel a little bit weird because there were just like so many people waiting for her to turn 18 that she made like a million dollars in the first six hours, so there's that creepy element. But at the end of the day, when she did this, she was a consenting adult doing with her body as she pleased, and she made bank, and even more impressively, right, she made it off of a weird Dr. Phil interview. She kind of did the reverse Kim Kardashian. Right? Rather than nudity or sex tape, and then going kind of more mainstream, she did the opposite. Though, I will say because of the rise of OnlyFans, that is becoming increasingly common. Right? You have a number of examples on TikTok, for example. You have very attractive people posting thirst trap, dancing, kind of lip sync videos. They then turn that into an OnlyFans career that makes them millions upon millions of dollars. Belle Delphine, who uh, just came back to, to the public internet, I think is a great example of that. Her and others essentially using every other social media platform as just a free promotional tool. And these creators, I think, are also a fantastic example of not every view is equal. Right? If I get a million views on a video, I got some sponsored dollars, YouTube, unless they demonetize me, they kick me some money. We do our clothing drops every two to three months, but you know, whenever you sell anything, you're kind of hoping, you know, one to 5% of people that see that content buy. But when you have a creator that is just selling access to view their body and you as a viewer, because you're watching them, you're already inclined to want to see more, every view matters more. And I think that's also why I think one of the most ingenious OnlyFans plays comes from uh, creators Adam22 and Lena the Plug. Lena, who we've had on the show before to, to talk about OnlyFans when they were changing their policy. But also she and Adam have this podcast where there is a safe for work element where they talk to often uh, adult stars and they can post that safe for work content anywhere. But then there's a whole porn aspect where all of a sudden they fuck their guests. And it's just really fascinating to see the, the safe for work social media pipeline to OnlyFans. It's just very mainstream now. But ultimately I think the main point of this story is I'm jealous, congratulations, and I hate you. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Keeps. Did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35? And the thing is, you don't have to just sit around and wait for that to happen to you. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has you covered. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with a scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And in addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps has an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. And you can get all these products delivered directly 
to your door, meaning no more going in person to the doctor's office for your prescriptions, saving you both valuable time and money. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash DeFranco, or just click that link in the description to get 50% off your first order. And then we need to talk about what's happening in Shanghai because shit is going off the rails right now. So authorities have been imposing an extremely harsh lockdown for weeks now to combat a COVID outbreak that's gotten out of control. The government prohibiting people from leaving their homes, even to procure food, instead just dropping off rations to people and many ordering delivery services instead. Though everything's causing a food shortage with social media flooded by complaints that residents can't access delivery services and weren't prepared for an indefinite lockdown. And as far as the lockdown, you had CNN's David Culver, who's trapped inside Shanghai, describing the repression there. The extent of my freedom is all the way to my terrace door here. We're lucky enough to at least get some fresh air outside. Our community volunteer is sending me this image of what's on the other side of our door, a freshly taped paper seal, a reminder not to leave. And adding how he has so little food that he has to ration it to make it last. Writing, in my community, the government delivers food once every few days. Deliveries range from a box of vegetables and eggs to a vacuum sealed piece of pork or some traditional Chinese medicine. And adding, the handouts alone are not enough to feed one person, let alone an entire family beyond a day or so. And now it appears that the food that people are getting from the government may be fucking awful. With Bloomberg reporting that people across several neighborhoods claim they got stomach pains and diarrhea after eating government food rations like braised duck and meatballs. With then more and more people confirming those claims until it became a top trending story on China's Weibo messaging platform resulting in neighborhood committees instructing residents to throw out the food and district officials opening a probe into the matter. So in addition to the government trapping people indoors, punishing them if they leave, forcing them to leave if they test positive, at one point splitting up families, they're going hungry because they can't even trust what little food's being given to them. It's a fucking nightmare, which is why it's not shocking that things like this really eerie video went viral recently. Right, those are people in their high-rise apartments screaming out their windows, wailing in collective agony. Then you had another video of a drone hovering overhead telling people, please comply with COVID restrictions, control your soul's desire for freedom, do not open the window or sing. Like, I can't even imagine what would happen if they tried to do something like this in the United States. Like, granted, you had people acting like they were doing this in the United States. But this is truly horrifying. And so we're seeing things like people coming out of their homes to protest the use of an apartment complex as an isolation facility, with police hearing them out, understanding them. I'm lying. No, police were actually beating them back in this video that's now gone viral, though it has been scrubbed by Chinese censors. The cops dragging people toward a white van, people screaming, bring them back. And just a few days ago, you had authorities suddenly erecting green fences outside apartment buildings without warning, apparently targeting so-called sealed areas where everyone is prohibited from leaving because at least one person tested positive. We've been seeing and hearing more and more, like over the weekend, there was this short documentary titled Voices of April, it went viral on Chinese social media with people telling stories of their experiences living in Shanghai. Though it's China and censors jumped on it to take down the film and stuff out any references to it on the internet, even going as far as to block the word April on Weibo. Though we have seen people try to fight back on spreading this information, the Chinese people have to deal with a crazy censorship from the CCP, so they have figured out ways to evade the censors like posting the video upside down, embedding it in cartoons, or circulating it through QR codes and cloud services. It's essentially this never-ending game of cat and mouse. I mean, fuck, you know it's bad when the government there is even censoring the first line of its own national anthem, which says, rise, those who don't want to be enslaved. I guess because it's easier than adding an asterisk unless the CCP is doing the enslaving. But ultimately, I think what this story shows us, in addition to the CCP's cruelty, is that while you can have health measures in place, Zero COVID is not working. And then we need to talk about the ongoing war in Ukraine, which has officially gone over two months now. And reportedly in that time period, Russia has lost more troops than they did fighting for nine years in Afghanistan. On top of that, they've lost hundreds, if not thousands of vehicles alongside making only minor gains when compared to their original war goals. That being said, it's obviously not all good news for Ukrainians or any good news. Thousands have died, including many civilians, and most of their largest cities are either heavily damaged from the fighting or in the case of Mariupol, essentially no longer exists. With millions also having to flee the country and the UN expects that by by the end of the year, well over 8 million people will have left, which is completely understandable because in addition to the extreme danger for the people there and their families, there's also low economic prospects as Ukraine's economy is in shambles, which is also why it's not super surprising that yesterday Ukrainian officials asked the U.S. for $2 billion per month in economic aid across the next three months alongside another $3 billion from other partners. And so far, the U.S. has provided about $1 billion in economic support, and last week, the Biden administration announced that it sought another $500 million, but apparently neither is enough. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen seems open to the idea, saying, we've got a 
find ways to meet Ukraine's needs, and on our part, it will involve going back to Congress with a supplemental request, and adding we were inspired by their courage and stand with them and will do everything we can to pull our resources to support the needs that are identified. Also beyond holding some talks in Washington this weekend, U.S.-Ukrainian officials also met in Kyiv, with Secretary of State Antony Blinken making his way there, which is very notable as he's the highest-ranking official to go to the country since the war began, and he made the trip alongside Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. And on top of that visit, the U.S. and Ukraine will have high-level talks facilitated by the likely appointment of a new U.S. ambassador to Ukraine pending Senate approval. But there have been repercussions to these talks alongside an increasing amount of arms shipments to Ukraine, which have angered Russia. Right. Shortly after Blinken and Austin's visit concluded, railways and train stations throughout Ukraine were targeted by Russian attacks. Which honestly isn't that surprising. Russia has bitched and moaned about the West arming Ukraine since the conflict began. And now that Ukraine is getting heavier and heavier weapons, Russian complaints have only intensified, leading Russia's foreign minister to once again ominously warn that the threat of nuclear war in Ukraine is real, as well as describing the conflict as a Western proxy war. Which, yeah, Russia would know how that's done since it's essentially from their playbook in Vietnam and Korea. And speaking of Russian audacity to complain about a conflict that they started, let's take a quick look at what's happening in Russia. Since the war began, there have been multiple instances of Russian railways and facilities being blown up. The cause of these officially is relatively unknown. Sometimes it's blamed on possible saboteurs in Russia, other times as a false flag operation, and other times as likely Ukrainian attacks. Either way, Russia blames the attacks on Ukraine and uses them as justification to quote, step up Russia's own attack. But can you imagine starting a war, bombing tens of thousands of Ukrainian homes, killing thousands, wiping cities off the map, and then getting mad when Ukraine hits Russian military targets. And understandably, Russia isn't getting much sympathy. With the UK's armed forces minister saying this morning that Ukraine has a completely legitimate right to attack Russian targets. But there are worries that regardless of how this conflict escalates, this could spill over into neighboring countries, although there are claims that Russia seems to be doing that already. But over the last two days, explosions rocked a radio center and security headquarters in Transnistria, a Russian-backed breakaway region in Moldova. And this isn't a common occurrence, leading to Ukrainian officials claiming it was a Russian false flag operation. And if Russia decides to invade Transnistria, then it could not only secure another Russian majority territory, but also threaten to open another front in the war. It also lines up with a claim made by a Russian military commander last week, with Russia allegedly aiming to take all of the Black Sea coast and establish a corridor to Transnistria. However, U.S. officials have been less quick to jump to conclusions. And Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby telling CNN that it was too soon to know exactly what happened here, who's responsible. We're watching this as best we can. And that's probably a good place to end because the sentiment reflects a lot of how this war has gone. We never fully know what Russia's war aims are and they seem to be extremely flexible. But there are expectations that Russia is a aiming to ramp up its efforts in Ukraine by May 9th in order to mark a major military holiday there. So Putin, whether real or not, will likely want to have some kind of victory to rally around. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, subscribing to these daily dives in the video. My name's Philip DeFranco, you've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.